Lord God, whose blessed Son, our Savior, gave his body to be whipped and his face to be spit upon, give us grace to accept joyfully the sufferings of this present time, confident of the glory that shall be revealed through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, on Saturday nights, uh, Brooke and I will frequently try to uh, find something encouraging to watch going in uh, to Saturday morning, something that will encourage us as the Lord's Day approaches. And a couple of weeks ago, I found a video uh, that I just had to check out. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Bishop Robert Barron on YouTube. Uh, very Roman Catholic, he is a Roman Catholic bishop, but a very thoughtful guy and has some very interesting videos. Well, there's a, there was a video that I found that was an interview between him and Shia LaBeouf. How many of you know the actor Shia LaBeouf? Okay, so I saw that and I was like, okay, how did these two get into the same room? I have to know what they are talking about and why they are talking uh, to each other. How did, they, how did, how did this happen? Well, it, it turns out that Shia LaBeouf kind of like fell off the edge of the planet and that he got himself into some real trouble. Um, he was at a place in his life where he'd become known as a great actor, acted in some, you know, well-known movies, uh, but his life was falling apart, like utterly falling apart. In his own words, uh, he was on fire, and I do not mean that in a good way. He had a gun on the table, and he was ready to check out of life. So that's how he, well, that's the beginning of how he got in the same room with Bishop Robert Barron. Well, in the process of all this, in the process of his life falling apart and making some horrible decisions, he's offered a part in a movie. No one will talk to him at this point, but he's offered a singular part in a movie about Padre Pio. Padre Pio was a Roman Catholic priest. Now, to make a long story short, I can say a lot here. But the, the, the main thing I want to emphasize is that in preparing for that role, he read the Gospel of Matthew for the first time. Never read the Bible before, but before he was an agnostic. He had an image in his mind of what Christianity was about. And in the process of preparing for this role and talking to Christians, he's told, if you're going to play this role, the first thing you need to do is read the Gospel. And he reads the Gospel of Matthew. And here's what struck me. He says that prior reading to the Gospel, these are his words, he says he thought that Jesus was like a, a, a soft, frail Buddhist. All loving, all listening, but no ferocity. In his words, the picture he found in the Gospel, once he read the Matthew of Gospel, was not that picture, but one of immense strength and masculinity of a different sort. In a word, he came to see that the meekness of Jesus Christ is different than the weakness he expected to find. He found meekness, but not weakness. Now, while it's a very Roman Catholic uh, discussion, again, the video is definitely worth watching. And, um, I think, he, I think he, in some sense, has become, you know, in a bare sense, a, a Christian simply because um, he can't find the words to express what happened to him. And that's why I think it's genuine. But more than that, it's an inroad into today's hard saying. As Christians, as followers of Jesus, we have a greater Lord who exerts a different kind of strength than the world around us. Yeah? A different kind of strength and a different kind of victory, and therefore he can tell us, who are his followers, do not resist the one who is evil. Now, I want to begin with verse 38. Let's look at verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Let's get this clear first. Jesus is quoting from Scripture. He is quoting from Exodus 21. Brooke read it for us this morning. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, because this is right for the, from the Scriptures, we have to deal with something. Why is it that Jesus seems to be setting himself at odds 
with the Bible. If you know the life of our Lord, he never does that. He's always quoting from Scripture, and in fact, he is the point of the Scriptures. He is the author and goal of the Scriptures. Now today, progressive and liberal theology would say, well, he is, you see, he is. He is updating the Scriptures. Uh, But that's a case of really bad interpretation. Um, Our own 39 articles speak to this, and they say what? They say we don't want to interpret one passage of Scripture so that it's, how many know the word? Repugnant to another passage of Scripture. By the way, that's really good Bible study. You never want to understand the Bible so that you're interpreting one passage in a way that's repugnant to another passage. Here it's a matter of application. That's what Jesus is getting at. Now, let's understand this. The law given in Moses, uh, excuse me, through Moses in Exodus 21 was meant to be, listen to this, this is important, restrictive and carried out judicially in Israel. It was meant to restrict judge, uh, justice in how it was carried out. Here's what I mean. Precise And compensatory justice was meant to stop things like endless blood feuds from happening in Israel. That's why that law was given in Exodus 21. It was so that justice would be done in the nation of Israel. Uh, Think of something more recent and more famous like the Hatfields and the McCoys, right? That feud uh, lasted officially 28 years in the 19th century, uh, but an article in the New York Times from 1908 claimed that 60 lives had been lost in the feud by them. So the eye for the eye, tooth for the tooth, uh, law of the land in Israel was meant to stop things like that happening. It was meant to be restrictive so that justice would actually be done in some sense. This is called the lex talionis, the law of retribution. And it also had another impact, by the way. It meant that the value of one's life was independent of social, racial, or economic background. It created an equality of life that was previously unknown in the ancient world. But here's the thing. The lex talionis, the law of retribution, was not meant to be how one was to live their life personally. In other words, they weren't meant to take on some kind of attitude that said, you know what, the way I'm going to live life is I'm going to get justice. In every case, it's going to be eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and that's how I'm going to live my life, privately and personally. That's not what the law intended, but that's how it was being applied in Jesus' day. It was not laid down, as author Jeffrey Gibbs says, so that a kind of do unto others before they do it unto you mentality would exist in the people of God. Not at all. But just like we saw in the taking of oaths, Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, which we read from today, they are directed to our everyday lives as disciples. That's where they're directed. You know what this tells us? This tells us that every arena of life matters to God. Every arena of life matters to God. Your workplace with the people that you have to put up with and work with is the arena of discipleship. Your home is the arena of discipleship. The grocery store is the arena of discipleship. All of these are the arenas where God is to be glorified and Christ made known, right? Jesus gives four examples here of what it looks like in relation to retaliation or revenge. So Jesus says, again, no retaliation. Let's look at verse 39. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to him the other also. Verse 39 pictures someone being insultingly slapped. People have noticed that if uh, if the person is being slapped on the right cheek, like Jesus says, then um, it's kind of a backhanded slap, right? Because most people are right-handed. 
So someone's being slapped across the face. It's an insulting, uh, backhanded, demeaning, insulting uh, slap. I think this could be literally or metaphorically. But what Jesus has in mind here is primarily insult rather than assault. Insult rather than assault. And it's here we see the great care that has to be exercised in how we interpret Jesus' teaching, right? If you have assault occurring, what's the, way, what's the right way to deal with that kind of person? You call the police, right? Like, that's the way you're going to gently deal with them and not try to inter- get, in, get involved with it yourself. You're going to call the authorities. Now, of course, there's all kind of rabbit holes We could go down there, but we don't want to miss the forest for the trees. We don't want to get the main point of what Jesus is saying, right? We don't want to miss that. It's interesting. Jesus tells us here not to resist the one who is evil. Not to resist the one who is evil. But what is Scripture clear about? That we are to resist the evil one. So Jesus says, don't resist the one who is evil, but Scripture actually uses the same word to say, always and everywhere, resist the evil one. Resist your spiritual enemy. So let me ask you this. In the way that we respond to the insults of others, are we willing to redirect our strength, the strength we have in Christ, to stand fiercely, not merely against our human enemies, but against our spiritual enemy? Are you willing to to redirect that kind of fierceness against our spiritual enemy, as Ephesians 6 says? Are you willing to love the sinner and hate the sin, as we hear so often? Are you willing to be meek towards others in a way that even a single shaft of gracious light would have the chance to fall on the one that you consider today to be your enemy? Are you willing to do that? Above all saints, you know that Jesus did that for who? He did that for us. He did that for us. He didn't count the insult of our sin against us, but came into our midst in great humility. Amen? He didn't count the insult of our sin against us, but He came into our midst in great humility. Let's look at verse 40. Verse 40 pictures an outrageous lawsuit. An outrageous lawsuit. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. He pictures one of his followers uh, being sued for the equivalent of a business casual outfit. It's kind of a ridiculous thing to picture. But here Jesus says, don't only give them your outfit, give them your coat with it too. So you know what that does? Lawsuit settled. Done. You've got my clothes. It's over. Radical grace has been given and the lawsuit that's pictured was over. The Apostle Paul gives a concrete form to our Lord's words here in 1 Corinthians 6 when he says that Christians ought not to do what? To take one another to court. He concludes his argument by saying, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your brothers. Now this is where we see that Christians belong to what? An utterly different kingdom. An utterly different kind of kingdom. Who but those who are part of a a kingdom where the king himself laid his life out laid down his own rights for us, could respond in such a way as that. It's awesome. And then, verse 41, let's look at that. Verse 41, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. This is a third example that is a concrete one. Many of Jesus' followers would have recognized it as he said it. Well, what's going on there? Roman soldiers uh, could and did conscript citizens to carry their luggage or to assist them. And if a soldier asked you to carry his luggage, you did it. You didn't have any choice about it. So Jesus uh, gets behind that to the attitude with which you're going to do that if you have to do it. Um, And we actually have a biblical example of this, don't we? 
when Simon of Cyrene is asked to carry Jesus' own cross, he doesn't have a choice about whether or not he's going to do it, right? Simon understood there was, there was no choice but to carry the weight of Jesus' cross. Here Jesus, in this, uh, in this situation, tells us not just to go one mile, but two. What does that mean? It means if you're compelled to do something, do it cheerfully and with the right attitude. It, you see, the wrong way to interpret that would, would be to say, well, Jesus said I had to carry it two miles. He didn't say three. Right? It, it's, it's all about the attitude you bring about to that kind of compulsion. It's really hard to find a modern parallel here, right? Because this kind of thing doesn't routinely happen to us today. Thanks be to God. But I want to suggest something. I think the key in what Jesus is saying here is our willingness to take on an interruption to our own schedule as an appointment from God. As an interruption from God into our schedule, right? John Newton... The famous Anglican priest, the writer of Amazing Grace, used to say that he took every knock on the door of his study as from the hand of God. And I think that's the key with this part of the saying. Can we see the interruptions that get in the way of what we think is important as an opportunity like Simon to carry our own cross? Right? Or are our own priorities just too important? I think that's maybe a way to apply what Jesus is saying. Jesus himself bore the cross, not out of simple obligation, not because he had to, right? What does Hebrews 12 say? Because of the joy set before him. The joy of seeing sinners brought to the Father for the Father's glory. He didn't do it out of a compulsion, but out of love. So can you take on the interruptions that come into your life in the same way? That's what you ought to think about. The last one is the person in need of money. Let's read verse 42. Verse 42. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And here we see again what I said before, that Jesus' teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount, it's broad and sweeping wisdom. It has to be carefully Applied. F.F. F. Bruce said this in relationship to our passage. Whatever sacrifices Jesus expects his followers to make, he does not ask them to sacrifice their minds. These have to be thoughtfully and carefully applied. In fact, we're called to renew our minds as Christians, aren't we? To renew our minds. Christ is not here saying that we should give indiscriminately. I don't think that's the right way to apply this. Martin Luther you know, typically blunt, says this, Christ is not telling me to give what I have to any scoundrel that comes along and to deprive my family of it or others who may need it and whom I am obliged to help. It's not the right way to think about this part. And you may know that here in this parish, I discourage people in the parish from giving monetarily to those who come on a Sunday morning. There are so many other ways we can be helpful to someone. Uh, We can give them a blessing bag. First of all, we give them the ministry of the Word and the sacrament, right? But that's almost too easy, too. Because it would be far more costly for you, brothers and sisters, to say, I'll take you out to lunch, rather than give someone your change for them to potentially then go and abuse. Right? I think that's a much better way to understand this part of the parable. The key issue here in all of this is the impulse and the setting of the human heart. That's the, that, is the, that is the essence of this passage. Listen, do I, do you, do you have a what's in it for me attitude or are you willing to be abundant in your help to others? Remember that each of us here this morning, we are beggars at the door of God's mercy, right? Right? That's how we come into the kingdom. And that today, again, what he's doing is he is ritually refilling our hands. And so are are we willing to bring that kind of attitude with how how we deal with others? When we think of this hard saying, what does Jesus ask of us here? What does he ask of you? Well, listen, examine again the default setting of your heart. 
is your default approach to life to get even, <laughs> to have your rights, or is it to give bold love to others and to heap up burning coals of grace? Romans 14, 20. He desires for you, for each one of us, that you would become a vessel, not a mat, listen, but a springboard. Not a mat for others, but a springboard for others to point to a greater grace and a greater mercy. We should always seek to preach the gospel using words, yeah? Like, that has to be done. If you're going to share the gospel, you've got to share it in words. But sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes all, you know, in our daily life and the, all the interactions that we go through, uh, sometimes all we've got is our actions, right? And we want our actions, our lack of getting evenness, our lack of, you know, I've always got to have the last word. I've got to, I've got to get even. No, no, no. We want our actions to speak of Christ too, we want our actions to be burning coals of grace upon the heads of others that make them reflect upon themselves and their own need for the grace of God. I want to end here. Um, something that I reflected on as I thought about Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount is the fact that we have to understand who he's talking to. He's talking to the wider group of his disciples, but he's also talking to the twelve. And what is he preparing them to do? He's preparing them to die, friends. To spend their lives in his service and then be put to death. Literally. 11 out of the 12. Sorry, 10 out of the 12. The original 12. Right? They're going to literally die in Christ's service. And here's what I'm getting at. If they cannot learn to put up with a simple insult, how are they ever going to die in his service? Right? How are they ever going to learn to entrust themselves to his greater strength if every time they get insulted, they have to get even? They've got to be in the right. Have the last word, right? Fight back. They can't. They can't. You may recall that in uh, February uh, 2015, uh, ISIS Islamic terrorists murdered 21 Egyptians, Egyptian Christians. Do you remember this? I know you do because it was, it was sent, out, sent out to the world via video, right? They were beheaded in front of the world. Their de deaths were taped and they were released to the world. Uh, their video was called A Message Signed with, the blood, with Blood to the Nation of the Cross. You see, friends, a jihadist must defend the honor of Muhammad by killing to the death. It is commanded. That's what a jihadist is doing defending the honor of, of Muhammad. But listen, as Christians, we have no call from Christ. We are not called to defend his honor, and we see it in this hard saying. His honor does not need defending. We don't have to fight back. His honor is his own, and it holds up. Uh, as in, in response, there was a, a powerful, powerful response from Christians. There was a video that was widely circulated at the time. It was called, um, Who Would Dare to Love ISIS? I don't know if you remember this video. Uh, subtitled, A Letter from the People of the Cross. So not from the nation of the cross, but from the people of the cross. And here's an excerpt of the poem that's contained in the video. If you can find it, go watch it. In 2015, the response in this video was to say, the world is talking about you. Your apocalyptic dreams and spectacular sins are now awakening the Middle East. In your holy war, come to holy ground. Come, children of Abraham, come. The people of the cross gathers at your gates with a message. Love is coming after you. Like a rush of wind grazing over the Pacific, from hills of the Mount of Olives to the desert winds of Jordan, from the cedars of Lebanon to the silk roads of the east, an army comes with no tanks or soldiers, but an army of martyrs faithful unto death, carrying a message of life. 
The people of the cross comes to die at your gates. If you won't hear our message with words, then we will show you with our lives laid down. Uh, Friends, listen. The situations, our, our lives, our daily lives, are not all that dire, thanks be to God. But martyrdom or not, each of us is called in this passage to lay our lives down daily with Christ. Yeah? In our approach to retaliation, our approach to revenge, our approach to having to get even with others, again, not as a mat, but as a springboard for others. That by your obedience to Christ and your understanding of the cross of Christ and the grace of God, they would then be put back on their own need for repentance and faith. Yeah? In the one whose strength we know in the gospel is greater, deeper, and wider than our own. Jesus is the name that has been exalted above every other name, not because He came with an army to conquer earth, but because the King laid down His life. And now, even in this hour, He calls others to receive His grace, to receive His cross. So let our actions this week, let your actions in every arena of discipleship be that springboard for others to come to know the same grace that you have. Amen. We give all the glory, all the thanks, all the praise to God, and we rise and we confess our faith.